Good evening. On behalf of the Indiana University College of Arts and Sciences, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Vanessa Klo, and I serve as the college's Director of Alumni Relations. Our Food for Thought live streaming series serves as an opportunity for our alumni and friends to hear from faculty experts, explore topics of interest, and stay connected with IU and the College of Arts and Sciences during this time when we are unable to easily connect in person. Before we begin tonight's program, I'm excited to announce that the college is engaging in a celebration of the enduring legacies of our alumni over the next academic year. Our Celebrating Alumni Contributions 200 Plus Years of Impact Initiative highlights the contributions our alumni have made to the professions, in their communities, and to the university. In addition to weekly social media alumni spotlights, we will host a special series of events like tonight's discussion for our alumni community, in addition to marquee virtual events with alumni dignitaries. Please follow us on social media and watch your inbox for more information about this special year of celebration. With that, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's featured speaker, Professor Julianne Graper from the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology. Professor Graper's research examines visual and sonic representations of Mexican free-tailed bats, fundamentally questioning the nature-culture divide and addressing broad philosophical debates about the significance of being human. Following her presentation, Professor Graper will be joined by Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology PhD candidate Isaiah Green. Green's current research involves the intersection between activism, nature, and spirituality in the pagan practices. You can submit your questions at any point during this evening's discussion. Simply click on the questions tab located at the bottom of your screen. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Julianne Graper. Thank you so much for that introduction um, and to the college for the opportunity. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All righty. In September, 2017, I wrote to bat biologist Merlin Tuttle with an early draft of what would become the first chapter of my dissertation. My text described how residents of the city of Austin, Texas, had mobilized bats' negative reputation as a way to unpack their own experiences of marginalization. I included the example of the self-proclaimed Black Rock Maverick of Texas, Bevis Griffin, who created the band The Bats in the 1980s to critically comment on his experiences in a predominantly white music scene. Merlin Tuttle commented on this section of my paper by saying, it all appears to come down to simple fear of the unknown, especially when it is made conspicuous by behavior, skin color, or clothing. This refrain was persistent throughout my inquiries into Austin's bat culture. We fear what we don't understand. I heard this statement from musicians and conservationists alike. While there is undoubtedly some lasting wisdom in this adage, my research begged the question, do we really fear what we don't understand? Or is fear sometimes mobilized in the service of a particular cultural agenda? Since the 1980s, Bat Conservation International, founded by Merlin Tuttle, has worked to re-signify negative representations of bats in horror films and other media. BCI has worked directly with the notion that we fear what we don't understand and has been wildly successful, as evidenced by the profusion of bat-centered aesthetic activity in Austin. Yet despite BCI's efforts, horroristic depictions of bats persist not just in film, but also in popular discourse. While performing educational outreach work, outreach, excuse me, outreach work with BCI as a part of my dissertation research, I frequently interacted with members of the public who either joked or were legitimately concerned about vampire bats, um, concerned that the city's resident population of harmless insectivores might swoop down and drink their blood. These associations come as a direct result of the history of bats in horror media whose tropes and narratives have made their way into allegedly objective journalistic accounts about bats. In this talk, I examined depictions of bats as horroristic others using historical examples from literature, visual art, and film. Like the conservationist I worked with for my dissertation, I argue that such horroristic imagery has real life impacts on bat populations. However, I claim that the persistence of negative depictions of bats is due to their utility in cultural negotiations, particularly racial politics. I argue that associations between bats and disease are rooted in biblical and colonial narratives, 
that continue to have real effects on scientific studies as well as their media fallout. The presentation will close with some speculation about the, repu uh, excuse me, the relationship between bats and anti-China sentiment during the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of the earliest depictions of bats in Western culture are found in the Bible. The Book of Baruch, canonical for Catholics and in some Christian sects, contains a warning about false idols, which are described as figures shrouded in smoky temples covered in bats, birds, and cats. The presence of bats is evidence of the idol's ungodliness, as the text proclaims, by this ye may know that they are no gods. Additionally, Leviticus contains specific injunctions against the consumption of bats, which are included in the list of unclean birds. It states, among the fowls, they shall not be eaten. They are an abomination, the eagle and the ossifrage, the osprey, the stork and the heron and the bat. The significance of bat eating in particular will be important in a moment when we discuss relations to COVID-19. Though the Bible itself does not contain descriptions of Lucifer with bat wings, art historian Tessa Laird has pointed out that such depictions became commonplace as a result of some famous biblical paintings. An early example is the 1356 painting Fall of the Rebel Angels by an anonymous artist shown on the left. Another is Gustave Doré's illustrations for Milton's Paradise Lost, which helped to solidify depictions of the devil as having bat wings. Laird points out that such depictions were so impactful that when Captain Cook landed in Australia in 1770, he declared upon seeing a flying fox that he had encountered a real life devil. We see modern day evidence of these biblical histories in the culture of Halloween. Some scholarship has looked for biological evidence to support the use of bats in Halloween imagery, suggesting that early settlers observed bats swarming in the fall as they prepared to mate and head to winter roosts, or that large bonfires held during the fall months might have attracted flying insects and by extension bats. The settlers associated the swarming bats with fall holidays um, like the Celtic Samhain, commonly considered a pagan predecessor of Halloween. While these interpretations are certainly possible, it is important to remember Halloween's Christian roots. Halloween derives from All Hallows' Eve, the night set aside in the Christian calendar for honoring the recently departed. History professor Nicholas Rogers argues that the overemphasis on Halloween's origins in Samhain in most historical accounts are a result of both the rise of New Age paganism as well as paradoxically the religious right. Christian evangelists have decried Halloween's associations with Samhain in order to highlight its allegedly satanic quality. However, Rogers argues that Satanism is essentially a Christian creation. Indeed, the belief in satanic cults blossomed only in the late medieval era when it formed part of the persecutory discourse against heretics and witches long after the demise of Samhain. We can observe the perpetuation of biblical views about bats prior to the colonization of the Americas as well by examining the history of vampire lore. On their arrival in Veracruz, Spanish colonist Hernán Cortés and his chronicler Gonzalo Fernando de Oviedo observed vampire bats drinking the blood of horses and soldiers. Because they were unlike the European bats to which the colonists were accustomed, Oviedo's wrote, uh, Oviedo's accounts of the event uh, greatly exaggerated the dangers of bat bites and included graphic depictions of blood and disease. Bill Wasik and Monica Murphy have argued that positioning bats in such a monstrous light expressed European anxieties not about the bats themselves, but about the native inhabitants of the Americas, who were perceived to be backwards, animalistic, and not quite human. Oviedo's stories made their way back to Europe and influenced existing vampire lore, which prior to that time had not included biting victims, sucking blood, nor shape-shifting into bats. These tropes became codified with Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Dracula. In fact, an anecdotal theory suggests that Stoker may have added bats to his story after reading Oviedo's account of bats in Mexico. In the 20th century, these fears became codified in ways that reflected fears about invasion from cultural and racial others. The image of invading others as a metaphor for political relations traces to the Cold War, in which, according to scholar Hilary Dannenberg, science fiction films featuring aliens were used as metaphors for fears about infiltration across the other side of the Iron Curtain. Examples of such invasion narratives involving bats are plentiful, and their cultural significance changes depending on the particular anxieties of the time in which they were written. 
Examples include the 1999 film Bats, in which genetically mutated bats escape to terrorize the small Texas town of Gallup. 1974's The Bat People, in which a man is bitten by a bat in a cave and undergoes rapid transformation into a man-bat creature. 1940's The Devil Bat, starring Bela Lugosi, in which a man develops an aftershave lotion that causes bats to attack and kill anyone who wears it. And 1979's Nightwing, involving a series of mutilations by bats infected with bubonic plague on a Hopi reservation. While Nightwing drew on the success of 1975's Jaws, which caused a host of imitated films using other allegedly killer animal species, it is also a part of a broader film genre that some scholars have referred to as bat exploitation films. The term is a play on the word black exploitation, which refers to stereotyping of Africans and Afro descendants in film. While the parallel may appear tongue in cheek, it nevertheless highlights important continuities in the representation of non-human and human cultural others, in addition to the naturalization of racialized fears in the form of non-human animal species. Conservationists claim that negative depictions of bats have real effects on bat colonies, leading to inhumane practices by pest control companies as well as mass killing of bats. Merlin Tuttle states, quote, I have personally investigated instances where fearful humans have burned, poisoned, or sealed caves, killing millions of bats at a time, end quote. Such instances of max extermination are particularly prevalent in the COVID-19 era in which bats are feared as possible disease vectors. The case of Austin, Texas, however, is an example in which such negative associations were overpowered by changes in the cultural narrative. In the early 1980s, the 70-year-old downtown Congress Avenue Bridge underwent reconstruction that included the addition of three-quarter inch wide by 16 inch deep expansion joints. Unbeknownst to the architects, the size of these joints was ideal for Mexican free-tailed bat roosting, leading to rapid colonization of the bridge. By 1984, hundreds of thousands of bats had colonized the Congress Avenue Bridge. An estimated 1.5 million now live there when the colony is in season, a number startlingly similar to the Austin area's 2 million human inhabitants. Here's just a quick clip. Newspaper responses to the colonization of the bridge mimic the invasion narratives present in the bat exploitation films mentioned previously. Austin newspapers ran headlines such as bat colonies sink teeth into city and mass fear in the air as bats invade Austin. Petitions were circulated to eradicate the colony and local officials declared a public health crisis, citing reports of a larger than usual number of citizens treated for potentially rabid bat bites in 1984, despite the fact that rabid bat bites are extremely rare. Like the horror tropes that they were derived from, Austinites' fears of invading others uh, reflected racial prejudices, particularly against immigrants. It is no accident that the immigration reform became a major topic in US politics in the early 1980s, precisely at the time that these cultural depictions and their real life counterparts came to the surface. Anat Singh has demonstrated a similar phenomenon with so-called Africanized bees, which were not only described using racialized language in public media, but attempts were made to physically bar them from entering the country by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's construction of a barrier across the Texas-Mexico border. Singh describes um, this as a combination of, quote, fears of Mexican immigrants creeping over inadequately patrolled borders and fears of black-white racial miscegenation, end quote. Nancy Tomes has demonstrated a similar continuity between periods of germ panic and periods of increased anxiety over immigration in the United States. Charting concerns over germs from 1900 to 1940 and from the uh, 1980s to the 1990s, Tomes claims that, quote, both germ panics coincided with periods of heavy, heavy immigration to the United States of groups perceived as alien and difficult to assimilate, and that they reflected anxieties about social, societal incorporation associated with expanding markets, transportation networks, and mass immigration, end quote. As with bats and bees, cultural fears about invading others were expressed through other means. Austin was successful in changing its cultural narrative, largely due to Tuttle's efforts to humanize bats through photography and outreach events. The city now generates an estimated $12 million annual income through ecotourism from visitors coming to see the bats. 
Images of bats are now featured on purchasable souvenirs, the facade of music venues, and band posters. The official drink of Austin, determined in an annual competition as part of the city's summer bat fest, is the Batini. And in the late 1980s, Mayor Lee Cook declared Austin the bat capital of America. In addition to stereotyping bats as invaders, bats have also historically been associated with disease, perhaps dating back to Leviticus's categorization of bats as one of the unclean birds not to be eaten. Bats have been blamed as causes of disease, including Ebola, SARS, rabies, and most recently, COVID-19. At this time, claims that bats are the origin of COVID-19 remain in the realm of speculation. No patient zero has been identified, and as such, the origins of the virus remain unclear. Some sources suggest that the virus jumped from hu to humans from an intermediate source, a pangolin perhaps, while others suggest that the virus could have entered humans as a harmless microbe and mutated while there. Still others suggest the possibility of livestock as potential hosts. Conservationists claim that disproportionate sampling of bats as disease hosts are largely to blame for the overemphasis on bats in the media. In an op-ed written in late March, Merlin Tuttle pointed out that in some studies examining potential sources of the SARS pandemic, bats were sampled nearly twice as much as other species. Additionally, because bats are easy to sample in large numbers, scientists were able to publish more quickly. These numbers propagate exponentially as scientists seek out species that they think are likely to transmit disease based on the results of previous studies. Additionally, historical studies about bats and disease have at times produced erroneous conclusions, most famously the claim that bats can be asymptomatic carriers of rabies. Many human rabies diagnoses are based on postmortem analyses with only possible contact with a bat as evidence. Furthermore, early studies examined rabies transmission from infected bats to mice. It was later uncovered that the bats had not had rabies at all, but a rather a kind of Rio Bravo virus that is deadly to mice but harmless to both bats and humans. While bats can carry rabies and like other animals should not be handled except by a professional, they have no higher instances of rabies than any other urban wildlife. Nonetheless, they have become the poster children for rabies. The assumption that bats can be asymptomatic carriers of diseases like rabies has led to speculation about why bats can carry diseases like coronavirus without getting sick. Some scientists claiming that their higher internal body temperature helps them to combat disease more effectively than humans. However, such claims remain hotly debated among scientists. Similarly, bats have been conflated with other diseases and their attendant racist connotations. Sarah Monson describes how Ebola, another disease attributed to consumption of bats, was manipulated in mainstream media to reflect and encourage otherwise thinking about Africans, particularly through accusations about eating bats. The Ebola epidemic demonstrated a cultural double standard that led to racial blaming of Africans as the cause of the epidemic. Monson cites a cover story by Newsweek that portrays smuggled African bushmeat as a potential Ebola carrier and a threat to the United States. It was criticized, quote, for both its racializing associations of primates with Africans and its depiction of bushmeat, a West African delicacy, which the article calls a cultural touchstone, Monson claims. Quote, Americans also consume bushmeat, but call it venison and game, referring to the consumption of bushmeat as a cultural uh, as cultural, but framing it as exotic, dirty, devious, and other perpetuates the dark continent myth of Africa and reinforces xenophobia towards Africans and African immigrants, end quote. Monson's work uh, reinforces claims made by cultural geographers Glenn Elder, Jennifer Walsh, and Jody Email, who claim that, quote, conflicts over animal practices rooted in deep-seated cultural beliefs and social norms fuel ongoing efforts to racialize and devalue certain groups of immigrants. Animal practices have thus become tools of a cultural imperialism designed to delegitimize subjectivity and citizenship of immigrants under time-space conditions of post-modernity and social relations of post-coloniality." End quote. All this brings us to the current moment, the COVID-19 pandemic. As with Ebola, researchers looked at bats as a potential origin of the novel coronavirus based on existing research that bats have been known to har harbor coronaviruses, plural. Researchers do agree that the virus originated in an animal host and that an ancestral form of the virus probably developed in bats. However, to date, the SARS-CoV virus, excuse me, SARS-CoV-2 itself has not been isolated in bats. Instead, 
scientists have only identified a highly genetically similar coronavirus in bats. Genetic similarity does not mean the same virus, however. As a reference, Bat Conservation Trust Conservation Services head Lisa Warledge points out that human beings and chimpanzees are 96% similar genetically, and yet we are totally different animals. Furthermore, some early COVID cases were found not to have been linked to the wild animal market in Wuhan, China at all, begging the question as to whether or not that was the site of the first spillover to humans. While wild animal markets have a high potential for viral contamination due to the close quarters in which animals are placed, there is no direct evidence that COVID-19 first appeared there. The public claim that bats are the cause of COVID-19 is therefore a clear case of conflating correlation and causation. Furthermore, public outcries against these markets, while ignoring the possibility of transmission via farm animals, farm animals or other points of human-animal contact, underlie the belief that backwards practices of eating bushmeat were evidence of Chinese guilt and complicity in the spread of the virus. The possibility of the Wuhan wet market as an origin for the virus shifted when President Donald Trump's propagation of a theory that the virus originated in the lab of Xi Zhengli, principal of investigator at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. In a briefing from late April, Trump answered in the affirmative to whether he had seen convincing evidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the source of the virus, but declined to offer up what the, that evidence was. Dr. Xi, on the other hand, wrote in Wuhan's main Communist Party newspaper in February that she could, quote, guarantee on my life, end quote, that the virus hadn't come from her lab. She continued to, quote, advise those who believe and spread malicious rumors to close their stinky mouths, end quote as she mostly does genetic sequencing with computers, and when she has used samples from bats to culture viruses, she didn't use the COVID-19 virus. The paper initially suggested that the virus, uh, the paper that initially suggested that the virus came from Dr. Xi's lab was withdrawn after its speculation caught international attention. Trump has come under fire for his repeated use of the term China virus, excuse me, Chinese virus, against advice from the CDC and the World Health Organization and later for more, even more blatantly racist epithets like Kung Flu. His propagation of such terms has been linked to increased racist attacks against Asians and Asian Americans and continues to be perpetuated through internet media. A video produced by conservative comedian Norm MacDonald in which he appears to make a sandwich out of bat meat was filled with racist epithets in the comments section, among them the Shanghai Shivers, Slant Aids, and Mulan Cooties. The racist blaming of China as a source of the novel coronavirus has been made more than evident in recent news media. What has been less often discussed is the use of bat consumption, not only as evidence of allegedly backward cultural practices in China, but as scientific proof of China's guilt in causing the COVID-19 pandemic. As we've seen throughout this talk, these tropes don't come out of nowhere. They are successful in the current cultural climate because they are rooted in centuries of history in which bats have been used as metaphors for what is unclean, ungodly, invasive, and immoral. These tropes remain present in the collective consciousness through film, music, and other media, priming the minds of the public to receive messages like those put forth by Donald Trump. To close, I'd like to return to the question posed at the beginning of this talk. Do we fear what we don't understand? Undoubtedly, there is truth to this statement as educational campaigns undertaken by conservationists have been wildly successful in recuperating bats' reputation in select locales like Austin. However, we are also primed to fear particular things by our histories and upbringing. We can see the historical traces of biblical and colonial depictions of bats in Halloween, in horror films, and in media discourse. These things have real impacts, not just on bat populations, but on relationships among different groups of human beings. Undoing the negative stigma and the xenophobic narratives it espouses relies, therefore, on a greater understanding of where it came from. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to the Q&A session now. Yes. Okay. Um, the first question here is, where are vampire bats usually found? So they are found only in um, Central and a little bit of South America. Yep, there are three species of them. Um, 
they have been known to feed on humans, but they would really rather feed on other things, cattle, chickens, stuff like that. Yeah, okay. These other three aren't much as questions. So um, I kind of, I, I have a question. Um, so with your end point, especially on um, the, do we fear what we don't understand? It, it seems like too, you're talking a lot about how a lot of fear is generated from misunderstanding and possibly purposely misunderstanding. Mm. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about that, not just how, um, is, is there any correlation to that as well in terms of I know that some of this is based on our real experiences, but how make-believe kind of plays a role in this, I guess. Hmm. Um, can, I guess I'm not quite sure what you're asking just yet. So rather than, so I guess I was, my question was sort of in reference to fearing things that we don't know about, but I guess what you're asking is instances where we are given information that is wrong and that is causing fear. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think that's, I mean, I think that's absolutely true. Absolutely. Um, particularly in the current political climate. I don't know that I have much more to say about that, but I agree with that statement. Okay. Yeah, we've gotten some more questions in. Um, is there a similar or a similar reputation for bats in Europe or other Western countries? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, th I think a lot of the vampire lore um, comes from Europe. So I would, I would say that um, that and, you know, films that are made in the US, I think are also popular in Europe. I don't know. I don't know necessarily if there is a, a different reputation in particular countries in Europe. Okay. Um... The next question is, are any bat species protected? Um, and if so, how? Yeah, so there's a lot of bat species that are protected in different ways. Um, here in Indiana, you have, uh, so you have 13 species of bats here in Indiana. One of them is, I believe, federally endangered. It's the Indiana bat. Um, and it is threatened by population loss. It is threatened by um, issues with wind turbines. Unfortunately, that's a big problem in um, kind of the northern part of the state. And also something called white nose syndrome, which is a fungal disease that um, impacts hibernating bats. So what happens is some, some bats in the northern hemisphere, hemisphere migrate south for the winter, and some of them um, hibernate like other animal species. And the ones that do hibernate um, what happens here in this cold, damp cave environment, great for fungus to grow. Um, this fungus will latch on to them um, and it will wake them up too early. Um, so that requires a lot of a lot of energy and a lot of kind of metabolic use for them to do that. Um, so then they wake up too early and they have no food to eat and then they die. So it's it's really sad. It's something that there's a lot, a lot of people working on right now. Um, Bat Conservation International that I talked about quite a bit in the talk that they have kind of shifted their focus away from educational concerns to focus almost exclusively on that. Um, but yeah, so there's a number of different bats that are um, protected either at the state level or at the federal level. Yeah. Okay. We have another question. Um, can you talk more about the vampire myth traits shifting pre and post the bat connection. Pre and post the bat connection. So to be perfectly honest, that I am not an expert in vampire lore. And there are people who have um, built entire careers just writing about vampires in literature and film and all the other things. And that is not my area of expertise. So to be perfectly honest, I don't know a lot else about it other than that um, prior to um, these accounts about um, Mexico and Central America, um, vampires, they just, they were, they were very different in European literature. So they might suffocate their victims. Um, they didn't shape shift, things like that. I don't know if I can give specific examples. Okay. Yeah. Um, here's another one that I think is really interesting. Why do we love Batman? Why do we love Batman? That is an excellent question that I do not know the answer to, but it's very interesting. I think there's a lot of points of cultural crossover between humans and bats. These kind of like bat-human hybrids seem to be really interesting to us for some reason. And that that is in, in Batman, that is in vampires. Um, there's some cases of that in Central America. 
Um, obviously, the um, the Bat Boy that was in kind of tabloids for a while. It was supposed to be half bat, half human. So I don't know. I mean, I I, I think it would again depend on cultural context and a lot of um, a lot of other things. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Someone kind of put a comment towards another question, um, but I'm going to bring the question. So can you comment on alternate bat narratives? Um, are they positive in other cultures? So I guess examples of positive you know, narratives of bats in other cultures. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, um, there are there are some historical narratives about bats in Central America and Mexico. They're featured in um, the Mayan Codex, the Popol Vuh. And Western culture has tended to interpret them negatively. So there's this bat god, Kamasots, who is the kind of the protector of the underworld. And Western readings of that read that kind of very much in this horroristic, you know, vampire, scary sort of way. But I think within Mayan culture, that wouldn't necessarily be interpreted as a bad thing. So the underworld is kind of a natural part of life. So having, having an underworld guardian doesn't necessarily mean scary or negative. Um, there, it's also often thrown around that in China, bats are considered to be lucky. Um, I'm not sure the extent to which that is sort of a, you know, historical thing that people just like to point to, to the extent, I don't, I don't know to what extent that is um, something that is still prevalent in Chinese culture, or if it's something that was from a previous time that people still like to point to as evidence of that. Um, but then there's also, like I said, there's a lot of people um, in the West who are working to recuperate these narratives. So I kind of talk mostly about conservation stuff, but um, there is a really excellent bat rehabilitation organization in Austin called the Austin Bat Refuge. And one of the things that they're doing is trying to commission artists and um, just create more artwork that does present bats in a positive light. And I think that that is really catching on. I feel like I see that in a lot of places across the US right now. On a similar note, um, someone's question here that's kind of, I guess, stemming from this is, um, how would you suggest protecting species that are seen as other given how common othering is? I don't know. I don't know. If you have ideas, let me know. Um, I'm not, so I'm not a, I'm not a scientist. I'm not, you know, I do not work in conservation. I'm a cultural theorist. Um, but I, I do know that in this one particular case in Austin, right, it really has been extremely successful to work towards changing the cultural narrative. So um, I, again, I didn't talk about this in a great amount of depth, but in Austin, right, we had this colonization of this bridge and everyone's like, oh no, it's horrible. We're all going to get sick. Um, and one of the things Merlin Tuttle did was he would take, um, flying foxes, which are really cute. If you have not ever seen them, look them up. They are adorable. Um, he had one that was his kind of resident bat and he would bring it to people and they would look at it and they go, oh my gosh, it doesn't look like what I thought it was going to look like. Um, so that's one thing, um, things like children's books. So like Stella Luna, I think made a big difference. Um, outreach at schools, things like that. Um, yeah, I think, I think from my perspective, right, changing the cultural narrative is necessary to changing kind of the biological conservation stuff. Right. Okay, here's another question. Um, what do what do we make of the hypersexualization of vampires in literature? Um, and they're specifically thinking about like Twilight, Dracula, and even you and I have talked about before, Carmilla. Oh, yeah. He's another example of this. And then it, is this also otherization? Is it a positive or a negative thing? Yeah. So again, I'm not a, I'm not a scholar of vampire literature, but I have come across and read a number of different things that talk particularly about sexualization of vampires in like Dracula and all these other things. And I agree that that functions as a part of otherizing. I, the way that I'm using otherizing, I do not think of that as a positive thing. I think that, um, me, yeah, I don't, I don't think of otherizing as a positive thing. Um, but I think there's a lot of instances in a variety of cultural forums where that sexualization is used as a way of making an other appear inferior or exotic or backward or all these other things. So I think that that sexual trope um, plays into that as well. Yeah. 
Okay. It looks like um, some people want to hear a little bit more um, about the closing of caves in Indiana and elsewhere due to some sort of bat diseases. Oh, because of white nose syndrome, possibly? I think that might be what they're referencing. They weren't extremely specific but okay yeah. yeah again i don't i don't know the specifics of that but i would assume i would assume it's for white nose syndrome and the issue is that because it's a fungus um if you go to one cave and you get it on your shoes and then you go to the next cave and then you infect the bats then you know or infect the cave and then it later grows on the bats when they get there i would assume that that is probably why um and it's you know white nose syndrome is serious business in some places it has as much as 90 percent mortality so mm -hmm. that's really bad news for our ecosystems. Yeah. I do know, and Kate, just in case it wasn't about white nose syndrome, um, I know there have also been some limitations on bat research due to COVID. Um, and I think that's based on the misperception that bats here in the US could potentially have it or could potentially get it from us. Um, and I think that that is not really well founded, but people are um, have been asked People who work directly with bats have been asked to stop a lot of that research just out of an abundance of caution. Yeah, it looks like that was actually what they were asking about. Oh, okay, okay, good. They were talking about how um, someone's kind of answering about how the Department of Natural Resources closed caves um, because they thought mm -hmm. that caves were spreading. Oh, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, here's another. Uh, here's another one which I think kind of stems well off of this conversation of the the closing of the caves is um, what are some of the benefits of bats, um, I guess, to our ecosystems? Yeah, so they do, bats do lots of really, really important things. Um, in a lot of places, fruit eating bats um, help with seed dispersal for a lot of foods that we really like to eat, things like mangoes, stuff like that. Um, pollinating, bats are pollinators. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of, foods at tequila, right? They are very much involved in um, uh, agave pollination. Um, in this part of the country, we pretty much only have insectivores, um, so bats that eat insects. That's also super important to the ecosystem. Um, bats will often eat some really, really terrible crop pests. So that is good news because it saves farmers a ton of money. They don't have to spend money on pesticides and it is way more effective in terms of actually reducing insect populations. Um, yeah, they do lots of great stuff. Really important to keeping up biodiversity. Totally, yeah. totally, yeah. Um, another question here, um, which I would like to hear more about too, is how did you become interested in bats? <sighs> yeah, this is always the question, right? Um, I mean, they're just cool. That's really, that's really the answer. Um, I, I think I also had experiences when I was young. There was, um, I'm from the West Coast and there was a museum, uh, museum, I guess, where they had live animals that were local to the area and they had a bunch of bats that I just always really liked. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I lived in Austin when I was doing my PhD and I found out about this bridge where there's all these like tourist activity and I was just really struck by um, both the bridge itself and kind of the experience of seeing that many animals all at once which is really really impactful um, and yeah at the same time kind of all of the that stuff that seemed to be everywhere at the same time so yeah it was very I think it was very much a product of where I was at a particular time and kind of looking around and going I don't I need to make sense of I need to make sense of what is happening in my surroundings yeah. Um, this next question um, is, what if there turns out to be a valid scientific, or what if there turns out to be valid scientific evidence for the coronavirus migrating from bats? Yeah, I know that's, I mean, that's totally possible. Um, the thing is, the bats that live in China and the bats that live in this part of the world are so very, very different even if there are bats in China that could potentially have been a source of the virus, the ones that we have here, you know, honestly, they're just so different. I think that I would be very, very doubtful that there would also be um, an issue with that. And I also think, I mean, I don't know, one, one bat being a source of the virus is very different than like all of the bats being sick and giving us the disease, which I think is kind of the narrative that some of these media stories um present um yeah and i think that i think that's very different than maybe it originally came from 
a bat or a couple of bats. But yeah, I mean, the studies at this point are really showing it's people to people, you know, and that doesn't, and that doesn't mean, you know, don't be careful, obviously. So like I said, like the, a lot of scientific studies are being halted kind of out of an abundance of caution. But I think, I think there is no need for us to be afraid, particularly here in the U.S. right now. Yeah. And I think like what you were just saying too, it comes down to a lot of like um, representation as mm -hmm. well. And one of our questions is, um, are there other species that are paired up with bats um, in folklore or literature? Um, and do any other species um, share a similar kind of reputation? Um, yeah, I mean, I think other using other using animals as a way of representing cultural others, I think is huge. I'm not sure I know exactly what is meant by pairing bats with other animals. I'm wondering if they're asking um, <clears throat> if there's any kind of like interactions with bats and other animals, kind of like foxes oh. and rabbits in folklore and literature, if there's something similar to that with bats, maybe? There might be. I don't know if I know of other examples, um, but a parallel example that I just thought of as kind of as you're saying that would be wolves, right? So we have Little Red Riding Hood, we have Three Little Pigs and all these things where wolves are kind of treated as this, you know, scary other. And then in real life, those stories have impacts where people because they are they grow up with these stories as children they become afraid of real life wolves and then you know we have all these problems with wolves so yeah um someone's asking has our speaker ever been confronted by a bat in her clothes or closet i have not had them in my clothes or my closet i have had them in my house it was fine um we just turned off all the lights and opened the doors and let it fly out and it was fine. You know, it's not, it's not really any different than having a mouse or anything. You still, you don't want to pick it up, but again, you wouldn't want to pick up a mouse or a raccoon or anything like that either. Um, but no, they, I mean, they really have no, in, the, the stereotype that they will get caught up in your hair is also a mistake, right? They really have no interest in you. Um, and again, most of the bats that we have here, which are insectivores, are echolocating bats. So they have this really, really um, strong sense of where they are in space, right? So they can, you know, they can see you with their echolocation, so they know where you are. Um, and they're really, they're really not interested in you. The kind of um, erratic flight behavior, which I think is something that stresses people out a little bit, um, is usually them chasing insects, right? Um, so unlike, unlike a bird that's just kind of flying in a smooth arc, bats do jump around a little bit. And that's because they're, they're calling and hunting and looking for other things, but they're not, yeah, they're not going to get in your hair. They're not going to get in your clothes. Um, yeah. If they do get it, if you do have bats in your house, um, one thing to be aware of, there's a lot of pest control companies that are really bad and will try to poison bats and things like that. Um, so be careful, be careful of where you are looking for help with that. But one thing that can be done that's really quite easy, if you do have bats in your house, someone can come in, remove the bats that are there, and they'll do what's called um, an exclusion, which basically means they just seal up all of the cracks of your house um, so that there's no way for the bats to get back in. And that's really a very successful solution to that. Um, I think this is an interesting question too. You, you talked about... Um... I think this is interesting for a lot of reasons. Sorry. Um, uh, you talked a bit about how bats are like important to our environments because, you know, they, they eat bugs, especially in North America. And, um, that really helps farmers and, you know, crop mm -hmm. control with pests and uh, um, these kinds of things. And this person's wondering um, why, um, is there any conservationists pushing the fact that bats eat mosquitoes? Because um, I think mosquitoes are also kind of another negatively viewed um, species. So I'm one that that's. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is probably a part of some of the conservation narratives. The tricky thing with that is they do eat mos mosquitoes, but they would really rather eat something else just because mosquitoes are quite small and they're not very calorie dense. Um, so they do eat mosquitoes, but they're not actually as useful as getting mosquitoes, get, getting rid of mosquitoes as they are getting rid of like moths and things like that. Yeah. Um, do you think the politicization of bats helps your cause? 
That is an excellent question. I have no idea. Um, I think there has been a lot of media attention for bats. There has been a lot of stuff by conservationists speaking against that media attention. Um, I don't, I don't really have a sense of which direction the general public is leaning. I would say, honestly, the the politicization politicization of COVID nineteen, which is I, what I assume is meant by that question, mm-hmm. um, I think it's probably actually been bad for bats, even though they are being noticed. Um, there's a lot more negative media attention than there is positive media attention. Yeah. Um. This is another kind of general question. What are the predators of bats? What are the predators? So, I mean, it depends on where in the world you are and what species of bats. Um, I'm trying to think, thinking about the Mexican free-tailed bats in particular, um, I believe skunks, there's some snakes that eat them, um, lots of things. Um, I don't know about here in Indiana specifically. Um. This is a really interesting question. Um, can you comment about bats used as comic rather than horror? Um, and they're specifically referencing, I don't know if you watch The Office, but they're specifically referencing The Office scene when a bat comes into the office and everyone is terrified. And for those who haven't seen The Office in the episode, um, one of the employees continually tries to catch the bat and one of them pretends like he's turning into a vampire and leaves early and then they finally catch the bat with a trash bag. Um, They're wondering what your thoughts on that are like in in terms of bats being used in a sense of comedy, I guess. In a sense of comedy. Um, So I I don't know that I've seen that particular episode. It does sound very funny. Um, I don't know. So I think that that is, the way you described it at least, Isaiah, that sounds to me like it is playing on these negative depictions of bats. Um, It would kind of depend on how the episode deals with that to see if that was ultimately like refuting those or reinforcing them through the use of comedy. Um, But yeah, particularly the idea of a bat kind of being stuck in an office and, you know, nobody can find it and everyone's freaking out is kind of what I'm assuming happening. That's probably not a great depiction because it's, it's suggesting that bats are something to be afraid of or worried about if they're in your space. And similarly, I mean, we, like we talked about associations with vampires that, I mean, can ultimately have some really bad um, real life implications, including people torching caves of fruit bats because they think they're vampire bats and things like that. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of instances of that happening where people think, oh my gosh, it's, you know, it's going to bite me or it's going to, or, you know, in some places, oh, I'm concerned for my livestock who keep having all these vampires, vampire bats on them. Um, and then going and killing all of the bats to deal with that without realizing, um, what kind of bats they actually are. So yeah and but I, think, I do think comedy comedy is potentially a good route i think it just depends how the comedy is done yeah i think i think um in terms of those of you who have watched the office i think it might be a little bit more of what you were possibly saying there of uh, that it actually is almost a little bit more exploitive and reinforcing those mm-hmm. narratives because yeah. specifically in that episode when the character jim kind of fakes being a vampire um he's intentionally doing it to scare the other employees yeah. of the office and then not only that, after he leaves, the bat comes back up again, I think a couple of episodes later where um, one of the uh, employees is hospitalized and it turns out she has rabies and they connect it mm-hmm. back to her being in contact with the bat. So there, I think there maybe are some of like these things you're saying, like it is comic, but in another way, it's only kind of perpetuating yeah. some of these. Okay. Um, um, someone has asked, can you talk a little more about how the negative association of people with bats has led to stereotyping certain groups of people, um, suspe- uh, specifically Africans or Latin Americans? Oh, yeah. So a bit more about this kind of um, bats as racism kind of deal. Yeah. Um, yes, let me think how to answer that really quick. The case, well, I guess, yeah, I guess there's sort of two different things going on. 
Um, so what I was saying about um, immigration, particularly in the case of Austin, it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of drawing a parallel without having a direct. So it's a little bit of a correlation causation issue. What I'm observing there is just a parallel narrative in how we talk about immigration and how we talk about um, species that we think of as like invasive. Um, so I don't again. It's mostly just an observation of a parallel. I'm not trying to make a claim about correlation or causation there. Um, just observing observing a similarity. Um, in the case of Africa, with which I think is the Ebola example, it's a little bit different. Um, I'm taking that from a different scholar. Um, and what she says is that basically we're using this idea of eating bushmeat as a way of um, promoting a lot of kind of anti-immigrant, anti-African sensibilities in that case. So there's kind of two different narratives going on. And again, mostly what we're doing is observing discursive similarities without trying to claim, you know, this comes from this or this comes from that or anything like that. Yeah. Okay, we've got some that are more kind of commentary. Um, Someone says defleter mouse and the tick is much better. I'm assuming they're referring to the opera. Um, defleter and the tick? That sounds like another comic thing to me. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know defleter mouse is an opera. Yes. So I'm not sure if that's what they're, they're referencing. Yeah. Oh, she says it's a cartoon. Oh. I don't know about that. That sounds hilarious. I will look it up. Yeah. Um, and then someone else says this is more of a comment than a story. Um, their family always hangs up at least one black colored paper bat on their Christmas tree. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> why is a long story, but it always makes us smile. So that's kind of, that's interesting. Yeah. That's great. I had a period of time where I always made Christmas cookies with like a bat cookie cutter. So they're like red and green with candies that bat shaped. So I relate to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I want to come back a little bit to um, since I think we've answered the questions mostly for now, um, to Samhain and um, oh, yeah. and Halloween. And um, yeah, I think I'm just uh, interested in bats. I mean, we're at that time of year um, mm -hmm. and the, the use of bats in those um, in those kind of depictions. And I'm, I'm very interested in it in Samhain just because um, I'm, I'm wondering where it comes from, at least from the horror side, um, because generally Samhain is more like a, a, a kind of an honoring of the dead. So I'm wondering um, if you could maybe talk a little bit more about connections of bats. I know you talked a little bit about this earlier, about connections with bats and the dead, um, and maybe where that kind of has come from. Yeah, so I think, yeah. I think again, that might be, I think that's a case of stereotyping again. So I think the argument that I was making is that when we look at Halloween, we assume that it comes from this pagan festival and yeah. it may have some roots in that, but like really it's a Christian festival. Um, and the use of bats in Halloween, in my opinion, comes directly from these Christian narratives, right? Where we are using bats as a demonstration of the devil. Right, both from both from the couple of quotes actually in the Bible and from just the cultural history looking at looking at um, images and things over time. So the claim made by the history professor who that I was who I was quoting in that section is that the religious right and also possibly New Age pagans look to Halloween, they see these bad images associated with Satan, and then they kind of make these claims about Satanism and paganism and things like that. Um, but I don't know that I have read anything that draws a direct connection actually between bats and the pagan festival so much as there is kind of a stereotyping of paganism um, in that way. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Someone, I don't know if there is a way for us to post this for people. Um, they've talked about their experience as a caver and they've put up numbers for people on um, oh, yeah. uh, helping with bats in your houses in the Bloomington area. That'd be awesome. Do you want to just, you can, can you share your screen? Because I am, I am new to this area, so I don't have those resources. So thank you to whoever shared that. Let me see if it will let me share. 
Okay. Maybe not. Is it sharing this? Yes. Okay. This is what they wrote. Uh, well, so I see your email actually. <laughs> oh yeah. Sorry. We can actually share that in a separate comment. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to make you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. But yes, thank you to whoever sent that. Yeah. Um, well, cool. If that's yeah. everything. Yeah, that, that seems to be all the questions, um, at least. I would um, I would like to hear a little bit more too still on the on the um, on the the virus specifically mm. um, with bats. Um, just because I, you talked a little bit about there's no need to be afraid of bats, like kind of, you know, transmitting COVID to humans in the U.S., even if it kind of was mitigated to us from bats in the, mm -hmm. in China. Um, but I'm wondering, have you, have you seen, because I haven't like looked into this, I guess, enough. Have you seen any examples of people in the U.S. saying to stay away from bats in the U.S. because they have COVID? Just, I mean, just the example of research being closed. And I think yeah. the concern is less that people will get COVID from bats, but that people will give it to bats, which are already, you know, really fragile populations here right mm -hmm. now. And again, I don't know whether or not there's any evidence to actually support that as a possibility, but I think they're operating under the assumption that bats and humans have pretty similar biology, which is true. Um, but no, I don't know that I've seen a lot of, um, yeah, news headings claiming like, you know, hide from the bats or anything like that. But I mean, that that is kind of how I think some people have interpreted excuse me, interpreted the headings that have been appearing in the news, right? They say, oh, well, if it comes from bats, then, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, want to be anywhere near them. Um, but I guess the other thing to bear in mind, too, is that, you know, if even if you were in the same room as a bat that had a disease, you're probably, as long as you're not handling it, right, it's, it, it's not going to, like, pass the disease through the air, to you, you know, from a long distance away. So I think that's the thing is we have, we have a lot of bats in North America and here in Indiana, um, but we don't have, even when we are kind of in the same area as them, we don't really have a lot of direct contact with them. So there's also, you know, not really need to be afraid of them for that reason. Yeah. Um, I guess my, one of my last questions would be too is, is there, do you have any examples where um these kind of like negative depictions of bats and this like otherness of bats has um directly impacted conservationists efforts so i'm thinking more of where is there any examples where a conservationist has actually talked to like maybe a legislator or something and then the legislator's own like understandings mm -hmm. of these like kind of stereotypes of bats has actually impacted how much the conservationists can actually get done yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that at the level of legislation, but I think that's a really interesting thing to look into. Um, I know there are conflicts um, sometimes with farmers. I'm thinking again in Mexico where they do have vampire bats. Um, so there are some issues with vampire bats feeding on cattle populations, which farmers are really not happy about. Um, and there's some areas where vampire bats are just really, really huge populations. There's just a lot of them causing a lot of conflict with these farmers. So there are some instances when conservationists have had to go in and selectively remove populations of, and by remove, I mean kill populations of vampire bats just to kind of mitigate um, those conflicts. So that's really unfortunate. I don't know that that necessarily comes from a stereotype so much as um, a disagreement on that level. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it would be interesting to look at the legislation a little bit more specifically to see what kinds of conversations conservationists were having at that level. Yeah, especially that's interesting that you bring up the farmers kind of in conflict too, because, you know, it's also kind of a strain on the conservationists because you don't want them, 
to, you don't want the farmers to try to take things into their own hands kind of totally thing. totally yeah and they're, that's they're maybe not as trained and then they start doing things like you mentioned earlier where they like kind of set just caves on fire absolutely yeah and it's not like a really kind of control population thing and it's more of just a, an attempt at a complete eradication absolutely yeah. yeah all right well i think that is it from everyone on hold on someone's just saying that they they're a researcher and they've been forbidden to handle bats because of the fear uh, of creating the reservoir for covid yeah i have heard that also i'm sorry yeah. to whoever wrote that yeah and they're saying that it's also negative uh, negatively impacted bat rehabilitation nationwide mm. uh, i would like to oh yeah about that. i don't know about bat uh rehabilitation yeah, I don't, I don't know a ton about it either, but um, the few folks that I do know who are bat rehabilitators have had to, you know, limit the number of people that they're able to have come work with them and things like that. Um, I don't know what other, what other impacts it has had, but I would absolutely believe that that is the case, so. Yeah. Uh, the person said, in terms of your uh, saying sorry, they said, um, we did we did acoustic monitoring so it's okay thank you okay good good so i would like to take this opportunity to thank you again for joining us and participating in this evening's live stream event uh, I would also like to thank Professor Graper and Mr. Green for their time and their expertise we are grateful to you all um, Finally, I should acknowledge that events like this would not be possible without the support of donors who understand the value of a liberal arts education. If you would like to support the faculty, students, and programs of the College of Arts and Sciences, please consider making a contribution to the Arts and Sciences Priority Fund at the Indiana University Foundation. Until next time, please take care and stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you.